Magandang araw po sa inyong lahat. Ako po si Pastor ni Jeremiah Belhika. And I'm going to share to you about federalismo or federalism, the roots, reformation, and result. Ito po'y isang bagay na mira po natin maririnig patungkol sa usaping federalismo dahil kadalasan na nakikita lamang natin dito is yung aspetong usaping political, sino ba ang nag-advocate niyan, gusto ba namin ng mga tao sa likod niyan. But, Um, ang lecture na ito ay para ma- mas maintindihan natin kung saan nga ba nagsimula ang konsepto ng federalismo upang ang bawat isa sa atin ay malaman natin kung paano ba natin dapat tayo makilahok sa usapin na ito and what is the right framework uh, 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 within which we should be actually discussing this uh, topic. No? So let us first start Um, by understanding that itong usapin pong ito ay napakainit dahil ito po ay sinisi, isinusulong po ng ating Pangulo at gayon din po ng napakarami ibang mga grupo at yung ibang mga grupo naman po ay meron uh, kanya-kanyang mga dahilan kung bakit hindi po sila nagnanais sumuporta dito o kung bakit naman po sila sumusuporta dito pero ano nga po ba ang federalismo? Now let me just explain um First and foremost, a, a sort of a technical explanation. No, kung ano ba ang ibig sabihin ng federalismo talaga? No, let me just start by bringing you and and explaining the four elements of a state. No, ang apat po na elemento para tawagin ang isang uh, bagay na estado. First, in order for something to be called a state, it must have a territory. kinakailangan merong specific at malinaw na lugar na uh, maari mong tukuyin. No? Pangalawa, merong itong population o merong mga taong pinamumunuan. Pangatlo, meron itong organized government o organisadong gobyerno. At ang pangapat, ang pinakamahalagang maitindihan po natin, ito po yung tinatawag na sovereignty. Ito po yung kapangyarihan na pamunuan yung mga tao sa nakapaloob dito at ito rin po yung recognition ng international community at ng mga karating ng mga ibang estado na rin recognize na ang uh, isang uh, bansa nga ay indeed a state. Okay? So, meaning, kung wala po ang isa, isa lang ang mawala dito sa apat na ito, ay hindi niyo po maaaring ituring ang isa pong Uh, uh, isa pong state no na, na isang ta- isang bagay na itatawag na kiniklaim na state sila na state nga sila so katulad po sa Pilipinas meron tayong territory meron po tayong population dito meron po tayong organisadong gobyerno at meron din po tayong sovereignty and there are two parts of sovereignty it is yung tinatawag na internal sovereignty at external sovereignty pag sinabi po natin internal ang organized government sa isang state ay tinatangkilik ng mga kinasasakupan niya internally ng mga taong kinasasakupan niya. However, an external sovereignty, ito po yung relationship niya sa international community, sa mga panglabas po ng mga affairs na kung saan rinirecognize siya ng kanya mga karating ng mga bansa. Now, sa federalismo po, ang internal at ang external sovereignty ay pinaghahatian ng dalawang gobyerno. Yung federal government for the external sovereignty at yung internal government naman po para doon sa mga state, uh, yung mga uh, local states, yung mga individual states. no? So, sa mga tuwid, sa isang federal country, yung mga uh, usapin international, uh, panglabas ng bansa, yan po ay ang uh, federal government po ang siyang tumutukoy dito. National policy ay yung mga foreign policies, national defense, at yung mga iba pa hong mga bagay na that would comprise ang, ang external sovereignty po. Subalit, yung mga internal na mga bagay po, katulad po ng mga peace and order sa loob po ng, ng mga individual states, uh, katulad po ng sanitation, katulad po yung ibang mga basic services, yung local state po ang siyang namumuno, local state government. So, 
Sa atin pong present na sistema ng gobyerno na kung saan tayo ay unitary form of government and we are not yet a federal, uh, federal type of government, isa lang po ang gobyerno natin na nagpo-function ng pareho ng internal sovereignty at external sovereignty. Now, marami, po ni, marami pong mga klaseng federalismo na mga types and models, presidential type, parliamentary type, o yung mayroong mga French model, and it, iba-iba pa. Pero basically, ito po yun, no Yung external and yung internal sovereignty ay pinaghahatian ng federal state o federal government at ng isang local government. Now, sa makita po natin, ang usaping sovereignty, kadalasan uh, ginagamit din po ito sa mga sa mga religious na pinag-uusapan, sa mga simbahan, dahil normally, pag sinabi mong sovereignty, tinatanong mo sa sino ba talaga ang sovereign niya sa buhay ng tao? Sa isang secular humanist, sasabihin niya, tao ang sovereign, no? Uh, the people is sovereign. Uh, pero sa isang theist, sa isang tunay na nananampalataya sa Diyos, alam natin na ang sovereignty ng tao na tinatawag natin ay isang stewardship lamang. At ang tunay na sovereign talaga ay ang Diyos. Now, now, let us now go to the roots of ito po bang federalism na atin pong madalas na narinig. So, there, there is a biblical and historical roots of, of federalism o yung, yung tinatawag na covenantalism. Ito po yung makikita natin sa storya ng buhay ng mga Puritans yung mga nag-start at nagsimula po nung bansang Estados Unidos. Now, let me just ask you, when was the word federalism used? When was federalism first used? Yung iba sabihin, ay, alam ko yan, na unang ginamit yan nung panahon na sinisimula ng Amerika na nag umiimbento sila ng panibagong sistema ng gobyerno. Well, you would, you would be surprised to know that the word federalism actually did not start as a political concept. It actually started as a religious concept. Why? Because federalism actually means covenant. Or covenantalism and federalism actually are one and the same. In fact, the word federal has its origin in the mid-17th century. It came from the Latin words fodus, foder, which means covenant. No? Thus, the word federal was being used by the church more than 100 years, actually more than 150 to 200 years before actually the founding of the first federal country. Ginagamit na ito ng mga theologians, ginagamit na ito ng mga Bible teachers, Bible scholars, the word federalism even before you know, uh, yung mga, uh, mga tao thought of using it sa isang political sense. Alright? So, in fact, meron ho natin makikita nung 1689, meron tinatawag na 1689 federalism at meron pa tinatawag na covenant theology or yung federal theology. No, makikita natin ito sa napakadaming mga na mga iba't ibang mga teachings ng church. In fact, nung 1689, no? Uh, nabanggit ko na rin kanina. And this is 100 more than uh, about 150 years no bago po natin na uh, malaman na, ma- na ang salitang federalism sa uh, konteksto po ng politika so meaning it actually has a theological roots federalism okay now but when was it politicized okay in 1787 which is yung tinatawag po natin na Philadelphia Convention, the history of modern federalism began with the foundation of the United States of America. The Convention for the Revision of the Federal System of Government, better known as the Philadelphia Convention, approved uh, on 17 September 18, 1787, establishing the first example of a federal pact between sovereign states. So, nung 1787, nung September 1787, nagkasundo po ang iba't ibang mga states that they will bond together in a covenantal relationship. And this is what you call the Federal or the Philadelphia Convention of 1787. So, this was the time when 
when federalism was actually implemented in a political sense. Okay. So, the Puritan covenantal th- thinking, no? Puritan covenantalism was the great influence on the development of communities in early America or New England. The covenantal framework were first used in the church and religious spheres and organization. Thereafter, this the same coven this same covenantal or federal system were applied in the organi- in the organizing of towns, communities, and early American political organizations. These same covenantal principles and mindset are the foundational attitudes and mentalities that the congressmen relied upon in Philadelphia to identify and probably unconsciously the fundamental mechanisms of a federal system. So, ibig sabihin, way, way before nagkaroon pa ng tinatawag na Philadelphia Convention na 100 years prior to that, the Puritans, um, the Separatists, and the early colonial, uh, early New England or early America, nung hindi pa sila malaya sa Inglaterra, ay ginagamit na ang sistema ng federalismo sa kanilang pag-organisa na kanilang simbahan, na kanilang towns. So, when they finally decided to come up with a political system, no, sinabi nila, sinubukan nila, confederacy, hindi umubra. Now, let's let's make it formal. Tawagin natin itong federalism. This is a pact. This is a covenantal relationship. Now, so, it is also said ng isa pong expert that Puritan coven- co- covenantalism was foundational to federalism. So, Puritan contractualism or covenantalism preceded both the arrival of the colonists in the New World in the 18th century Enlightenment. It provided New England, or yung United States na ngayon, with the religious motivations of the particular political order that had been established uh, and influenced the new generations, preparing them culturally, and we could also say almost instinctively, for the federalism of 1787. According po ito kay Lorenzo Petrosilo at Elio Smedile, uh, dun po sa kanilang uh, uh, paper na ginawa po on origins of the modern federalism. Now, so ngayon, pero binabanggit ko po sa inyo yung tungkol po sa mga Puritans. No? Pero sino nga po ba itong mga Puritans na to? We have to understand, who are these people? When you talk about Puritans, sarinig lang natin, ah, Puritans, yung mga nag, siguro yung sumakay dun sa Mayflower at ganyan. Well, party, that's true, but there's more than that. The Puritans is an offshoot of a movement that you call the Reformation Movement. They are reformers. In fact, let me ask you a question. Why did the Puritans really leave England in order to look for a new place, no? tinatawag na New World? na nakita nila. So, why did they leave England? No? Tandaan po natin na ang England, noong mga panahon na yun, no? nung, nung, nung 1600s, 1500s, 1400s, England was actually a Catholic nation. In fact, yan pong picture na nakikita po ninyo sa likod, yan pong picture uh, ni uh, King John the I. No? Makikita ninyo, siya isang hari, pero siya po ay nakaluhod and he's presenting his crown or he's actually uh, uh, asking for the blessing. He's laying down his crown before the, uh, the, the, the feet of the Pope, and he's actually asking for the blessing. So, um, England, nung panahon po na yon ay isa sa pinakamasugid na tagapagtanggol at tag- tumatangkilik talaga sa kaharian po ng Catholic um, religion. Now, but the Reformation beliefs and ideas began to enter into England, into the England in the early 16th century. When rather more fingers than usual started to be pointed at the excessive riches and carnality of the Catholic clergy and monasteries. Demands were being made by people for the Bible to be translated so that they could read the scriptures in English rather than Latin and a desire for a simpler way to worship the deity and move away from the ostentatious Catholic ritual was beginning to be expressed. So, Reformation beliefs in, this, in the early 16th century, pumasok na po sa England ito. So, nagkakaroon na po ng maliit na mga grupo na nagsasabi sa kanila na sandali, 
parang um, ayaw na namin ng masyadong elaborate na way of worship we wanted to be to have a worship that is direct to God so it was also wrought about by during that time by some um, corruption that was happening dun po sa tinatawag na governmental structure po nung simbahan so so thus the reformers doon po sa Europe no nasinimulan po ng taong ito na tinatawag po na si Martin Luther so Martin Luther he is a um, monk he is a, he is a uh, Catholic monk that after studying the Bible as a monk Martin Luther became a priest and a scholar during his studies of the Bible Luther became convinced that salvation could not be achieved by good works and sacraments instead Luther was inspired by St. Paul's epistle to the Romans who said, A person can be made good by having faith in God's mercy. Yung tinatawag na sola gracia, only by the grace of God, and only by faith, sola fide, and only in the scriptures, sola scriptura, ang tao ay maaring ma- maligtas sa pamagitan ng kanyang pananapalataya at direktang relasyon sa Diyos. And in fact, ito pa si Uh, si Martin Luther is siya din ang um, talagang nagturo ng tinatawag na priesthood of all the saints of all of the believers na kapag ikaw ay mayroong uh, pananapalataya sa Panginoon at tinanggap mo ang Panginoong Yesus ikaw mismo ay nagiging uh, pari at maari ng pumasok sa presensya ng Diyos at remember that claim actually is, was very very bold bakit? kasi it implied na hindi mo na kinakailangan dumaan doon sa elaborate na governmental system ng simbahan during the time. Now, sinundan pa ito no from from Germany, nagkaroon ng tinatawag na Lutheran Church and you know, the rest is history and tumalon nito sa ibang mga karatig na lugar doon sa Europa. And this guy came uh, si John Calvin. Calvin Calvin who is who actually Uh, naging inspirasyon sa kanyang mga followers to start yung tinatawag na Calvinism. He is said to be the the greatest uh, theologian of the reform reformation era. So, Calvinism was all Calvin was very strong with with the with the soli deo gloria only by the glory of God, sola scriptura only by scripture, sola Cristo, sola gracia and sola fide. And ito natin makikita yung theology na tulip, no? Uh, para dun sa iba mas nakakaintindi uh, Calvin was a strong uh, teacher of the sovereignty of God over the affairs of man and that is again a uh, a very bold claim na sinasabi na, na ang tunay na sovereign lang talaga ay ang Diyos sa buhay namin kaya kami dapat ay may obligasyon direkta sa Diyos at hindi ang tao ang dapat nagdidikta sa amin So, now, so knowing Calvin, uh, knowing uh, Martin Luther, knowing Calvin, uh, and uh, the other reformers that came after, makikita natin that the foundations talaga ng organized uh, uh, government talaga, religious government, was really being shaken at this time. So, yun ho yung mga pumasok na mga thinking dito sa tinatawag na... na England no early 1600s. Right? Now, let us now go to this person that you see in the picture. Ito po yung isa sa mga sikat na sikat na hari ng Inglaterra. Ito po si King Henry VIII. Now, King Henry VIII is the one who decided that England will finally divorce itself from the Roman Catholic Church. Well, King Henry VIII is a very, you know, aside from his very huge frame, but he is really a, a man with a very huge character. Um, he wanted a divorce from his wife uh, dahil ang sabi ng iba, dahil gusto pa raw niya mag-asawa ng iba, pero ang, ang, ang sinasabi naman ng iba, no, uh, King Henry VIII wanted to divorce ang kanyang unang asawa dahil um, ito'y byuda ng kanyang unang kapatid nakatatandang kapatid at yun yung paniniwala na hindi siya mabigyan ng, ng anak na lalaki dahil ito ay malaki ang tanda sa kanya I think she was already in, in her 40s and uh, King Henry was uh, still in his 30s and he said na parang hindi ito ang kalooban ng Diyos sa buhay ko so, but 
uh, King Henry VIII was actually a devout Catholic before he decided to um, separate from the Roman Catholic Church. In fact, he was even called the defender of the faith by the by the uh, by the Pope. So, but uh, long story short, in 1534 he decided to separate from uh, uh, Roman Catholic Church. So there was a split from Rome and the Pope and declared himself you know the head of the Church of England so therefore he uh, King, King Henry VIII became uh, the head not only of the state of England but he also became the head of the Church of England so so there was a divorce that created a rift between the two great nations the uh, Spain which is Catholic in England which eventually became Anglican yung tinatawag na Anglican Church which is headed by the King of England up to now po no? um, yung iba po sa inyo marahil alam ng head ng Anglican Church up to now is the Queen of England so so makita niya dito sa picture yan ho yung unang tatlong naging asawa po ni King Henry VIII si Catherine of Argon Aragon uh, which is actually Spanish Spanish descent na meron pong koneksyon na matibay po doon sa Vatican uh, si Anne Boleyn, Boleyn uh, si Jane Seymour and then so on so forth I think uh, Anim or Pito pang asawa ang kanyang na pang asawa after that now so therefore nung nag split po ang, ang, ang finally itong si si uh, King Henry VIII inig split po sila at ang England po ngayon ay kumawala na doon sa Roman Catholicism masaya-masaya po yung mga uh, nagsisimulang mga reformers doon sa ilalim sinabi na finally we will be reformed maayos na po ang aming pananampaltaya so balit the Anglican Church was not actually reformed no because this new entity the Church of England was essentially also like the Catholic Church but without the Pope and the monasteries and was essentially a conservative institution with the king as its head for the rest of the reign of King Henry VIII and the subsequent Tudor monarchs there would be a fierce competition between the new Protestants or yung mga reform- reformers and the Catholics for, su- for supremacy with several shifts of power that we- which would see many innocent people caught in the political crossfire and executed for their religious belief so, makita natin na uh, yung Anglican Church nandun doon pero may pagtatalo yung mga protestante, uh, yung mga reformers at yung tinatawag po na mga, sa mga Catholic Church o yung mga Catholic Now, therefore, dahil nakita po ng mga tao that you know, even if they if, if England was already uh, has already disengaged itself from the Pope but it was still not um actually reform in its ways no parang ganun din wala pa nang pagbabago kaya nagkaroon na pare bagong movement ang tinatawag mo dun sa movement na yon yung puritanism o yung mga tao na puritans ang ibig sabihin nito gusto lang i-purify yung Anglican Church sa kanilang um web ng deception pa rin nang galing pa rin dun sa kanilang pinagmulan so that's why it's a religious movement that aimed at reforming the Church of England. So a new group began to emerge who would become known as the Puritans, who would virulently oppose the elaborate ritual and liturgy of the Catholic Church that they believed was still too prevalent in the Church of England and who resented and wanted to eliminate any religious practices that in any way still resembled the Catholicism from which the new church had sprung from. So, yung mga Puritans, ayaw nilang umalis sa Anglican Church. They just wanted to reform it or in their own words, purify it. Now, so, what does the Puri- what, what uh, did the Puritans believe? No, well, first of all, Puritans were reformers. That's why they're also Calvinists. No, God was all-powerful and all-good. Yan ang kalapaniwala. Humans were totally deprived. And they also believed in uh, the predestination which is God was all knowing and knew beforehand who was going to heaven or hell if they believe in election they believe in uh, that good works did not determine salvation no 
uh, that one can, uh, could not act immoral since no one knew their status before God at tinatawag nila yung tinatawag na kapag ikaw ay niligtas ng Diyos makikita sa iyong ginagawa so there is visible saints hindi ka pwedeng niligtas ng Diyos pero ikaw ay walang pagbabago sa iyong buhay so you will see the brand of Christianity that the Puritans had they were really radical makikita mo na sila ang pinakamasisipag sila pinakamatsitsaga sila pinakaindustrious sila pinakamagaling paraan because naniniwala sila na kung talagang niligtas sila ng Diyos kinakailangan magbago ang kanilang buhay at kanilang ugali so they were really driven so of course this belief in the supremacy of God put them in a collision course with the rulers of the day okay uh, who having managed to regal free from having deferred to the Pope were not too keen to have uh, on having to moderate their rule and control of the church in, 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 in order to please the deity now so Nandun pa rin ang mga Puritans sa England. Gusto nila ay reform ang England. Pero hanggang sa dumating itong taong itong tinatawag na sa King Charles I. So King Charles I came to the throne in 1625. In the first few years of his reign, Puritans, the Puritans in Parliament strongly opposed his royal authority. But in order to maintain his royal power base and rid himself of those he viewed as his enemies, including many Puritans, Charles I took the unprecedented step of dissolving parliament altogether in 1629. Dinissolve niya yung parliament. Kung baga wala na, tanggalin na yung senado, tanggalin na yung kongreso, tanggalin na representative ninyo, ako na lang. No? Eh, maaaring tatanong kayo, eh, pwede namang gawin pala ng hari yun. Opo, pwede niya gawin yun. Subalit, nung, 12, nung 1200 po, no? ma, ma, many hundreds of years before this happened, maybe 400 years before it happened, nagkaroon po ng kasunduan ng hari at ang mga kinakasakupan sa England, nagkaroon po ng tawag na Magna Carta, sinasabi, o oh, sige, pagbibigyan ko kayo, kayo ang magkaroon ng sariling gobyerno ninyo para patakbuhin yung mga personal affairs ninyo. So, during that time, the king was actually respecting the representation of the people through the parliament. Pero sinabi ni King Charles I, ah, ayoko nang lalo na yung mga puritans na yan, abolish ko yung um, parliament na yan. So, they were forced to live in search of a promised land. So, the Puritans probably quite rightly interpreted this as a hostile act towards themselves and their religious practices. So And so, many decided to leave England and settled in the Americas no, where they could develop their own communities based on their own beliefs. Sabi, alis na tayo dito. Uh, wala na tayo mapapala dito sa, sa England dito kay uh, King Charles I so they left no and then dun sila no? yung tinatawag na nung 1629 ito yung Great Migration na kung saan si King Charles actually granted a group of Puritans and merchants a charter to settle in New England no nagpaalam naman sila dun sa hari sinabi nila ma- ma- mahal hari hindi na tayo magkasundo Payagan nyo na kami. Magtayo kami ng bagong kolonya doon sa banda ron, across the, the the sea. So they were given the authority. So they went across the sea. They formed new communities doon sa Massachusetts Bay Company. no? Doon sila nagkaroon sa Boston. Doon sila nagsimula magkaroon ng iba't ibang mga kanilang mga lugar. No? Of course, sa Jamestown nagkaroon nung, 16, nung 1607. So balit, talagang nagsimula ang Great Migration ng mga Puritans doon na sa Boston. So, most of these Puritans, Puritan immigrants headed for an area known as New England and they founded a Massachusetts, the Massachusetts Bay Colony in 1629. In fact, the decade of 1630 to 1640 became known as the Great Migration and some 8,000 Purit- Puritans left England in Europe during this time. Ganong kadami, mass migration. Pero actually, it's very telling because meron hong magandang nangyayari doon sa Massachusetts Bay Colony that they discovered when they were allowed to express their faith in the way that they would want to. So, but, 10 years before that, before the 1630 to 1640 Great Migration, merong maliit na band na grupo ng mga Puritans na nag-decide na iwanan na natin itong mga kapatid natin ng mga Puritans, umaasa pa rin na mababago itong 
itong uh, Anglican Church, iwanan na natin yan. Let's separate ourselves. So, they were called the separatist. No? So, there were also groups of migrants known as separating Puritans or separatists who believed that the Church of England was so corrupt and resistant to reform that they needed to form their own congregations. One of the most famous of this separatist group was the 100 Pilgrims Father who sailed to New England on the Mayflower in 1620, landing at a place that became known as the New Plymouth. So, noong 1620, merong mga 120, some 120 Puritans, separatists na sinabi na wala na, suko na kami, hindi na magbabago itong, itong hari namin, itong... Uh, uh, itong uh, Anglican Church mauna na tayo so umalis sila aboard the Mayflower so and 10 years after yun na po sumunod na po yung 80,000 na mga tao no uh, na Puritans dahil nakita nila na nag, nag umiipekto at mag- maganda yung nangyayari dito sa New England no of course the New England we now know it's now called the United States now so, the pilgrims, you know, we have the separatists. It's a religious group that broke from the Church of England. It sought freedom from, the, from, from persecution and bad treatment. 1620, the Mayflower landed at Plymouth. And of course, uh, there's other stories na hindi na natin ikwento. Now, this is what is very interesting dito po. Doon sa, sa separatist group, doon sa 120 na taong unang umalis. The Mayflower Compact. This was the first covenantal compact that itong mga tinatawag na mga uh, nag, nag-start ng, ng bagong community dyan. It, they came up with a covenantal pact. No? It's the May, uh, co, uh, Mayflower Covenant. O yung, yung uh, tinatawag na uh, isa sa mga basis na tinatawag na naging ng federal thinking ng early Americas. So, sabi mo sa The Mayflower Compact, mababasa natin, do by this presents solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and one another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic. Kailan po nila ginawa ito? Nung habang sila'y nandutuon pa lang sa barko ng Mayflower at hindi nila alam kung anong mangyayari sa kanila noong 1620. At sinabi nila hindi natin alam mangyayari sa atin pagdating natin doon sa bagong lugar na gusto natin puntahan magtatayo tayo. Let's form a covenant today na hindi tayo mag and in fact we're gonna start a civil body politic. They were really thinking of, of starting a new nation. No? All right So Therefore, they have this what they call the federal theology. So Puritans strongly dissociated themselves from the official confession of the king and the English people or Anglicanism, yet also from the confessions that were much closer to theirs, to theirs such as Presbyterianism, since they were oriented towards a specific theology, what you call the federal theology. No, at according po ito kay T. Bon- Bonazzi um, sa kanya pong isinulat now, remember this is 1600s nag-start po ang Amerika nagkaroon po ng unang federal uh, form of government 1787 but this is way way before that they already have that what you call federal theology so there are so many federal theolo- theologians and reformers in history, makikita po natin dyan. Now, so there is now a new and more elaborate conception of covenant that became evident in various English and Protestant fellowships that were intent on uniting through pacts founded on free consent of the contracting parties. These pacts committed the con- committed the contracting parties not only to live by a Christian way in all circumstances but also to enter into a new and more Christian community behind a varied ritual and an apparent simplicity with regard to expressing their consensus were hidden on on the one hand a different conception of the church and society and on the other a real practical theology so 
This belief led into what? Into, into a formation of a new kind of society. Now, the concept of a covenant theology allowed allowed these Puritans, allowed this 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 um, separatists to form communities by covenanting freely by choice. By virtue of their federal theology, Puritans rethought the idea of covenant and began to understand its great personal and social implications. They started to enter into covenantal relationships with one another which were founded on voluntary and free consent. Ito po yung revolutionary at the time dahil hindi ka po basta-basta pwede magtayo ng simbahan o ng kongregasyon <coughs> dahil gusto mo lamang. Hindi ka pwede magtayo ng isang gobyerno dahil nagkasundo-sundo lamang kayo. Kinakailangan may basbas ng papa galing sa taas. Kinakailangan may basbas ng leaders ng Anglican Church, ng hari ng Inglaterra. But this time, because of the federal theology, it did not require it did not require anything else but a covenantal relationship between themselves. So it is it is therefore enough that their followers submit to rituals handed down by priests and clergy. Yun po ang paniniwala ng iba tuon sa sa Anglican and sa Catholic Church. But this 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 Puritans, this new this this new form of belief that tinatawag nila. The federal theology led the way for them to start their own communities, to start their own churches and congregations. In fact, ito po yung tawag na congregationalism. So, they understood that being a follower of Christ should help them shape their community and have a positive social impact. So therefore, they were free to start their own communities and churches. Through these federal and covenantal beliefs, the Puritans now have the basic foundational justifications that would allow them to establish independent congregations which are self-sufficient and self-sustaining without the need to depend upon a centralized church government, either Anglican or Roman Catholic Church, or even the crown or the king. Therefore, ito po nagsimula yung tinatawag na isang movement or yung congregationalism. So their small home based on Christian communities were later called congregations. Kaya po, yung meron po mga sistema ngayon tayo na naririnig, ano yung congregation mo? So, this congregationalism movement, sinasabi, pwede kayo magsimula ng sarili yung congregation nang hindi kayo nagaantay sa ano pang mga organized religion. Now, you know, dahil nga itong mga <laughs> Puritans, itong mga uh, eventually, itong mga Quakers, itong mga congregationalists, Dumami sila ng dumami dito sa New England na tinatawag and they started to form their congregations and their way of life around their culture of federal theology. Now, and then they started to what? To implement a social covenant in the township system. No, sinabi na total, ano na rin, pati pagpili natin ang leaders natin, pagbotohan na natin kung sino yung leaders natin dito. No, hindi, hindi ganun. Ina-appoint ng hari. Now, they get to to vote kung sino yung gusto nila. So, they convinced that they were following biblical laws and designs of the divine providence and that separate spiritans of Massachusetts spread, spread their covenant ideas to an extremely large number of areas of colonial life. Of this, we went, we, uh, we want to mention the particular social covenant through which new towns were formed. So, dumami na dumami po yung mga towns because of this. Now, I will skip this. Okay. Now, makikita natin that because of this federal theology, this federal attitude, this federal mindset, there was what you call a culture of self-government. That everybody was responsible for themselves, a self-government for their families, they were responsible for their own children, and the children were for, responsible for their, for their uh, uh, sa kanilang relationship sa kanilang parents, and the communities, the congregations were self-sustaining upon, uh, on themselves. So there is a tinatawag natin na mentality na hindi sila walang pabigat sa community. <laughs> hindi katulad na nangyayari sa mga panahon natin ngayon na uh, kapag ikaw ay uh, ayaw mong magtrabaho, ikaw ay tatamad-tamad, marami mga tao na thinks that the government should be carrying their own load. But in this 
federal attitude, they believe that everyone should be productive on their own. Okay? Now, so what are the principles of law and liberty that we can draw from the examples of the Puritans? Number one, no? makikita po natin that the Puritans taught us that there should be no concentration of power to man. First, the centralization and concentration of power imperils the rights and freedoms of the governed, whether it may be in church or in civil spheres. It also showed that the fusion of both the, inst- the church and the institutional uh, government leads to religious oppression of the minority, especially when the powers for both are held by a single head. Nakita na dapat pala may separation of church and state. So in fact, it, yung model na makikita natin of God's authority, the, the family, the church, and the civil government, they are separate civil, they are separate governments on their own, no? But they are all all under God. Now, makikita rin natin dito yung sila din ang ang talagang nagturo no tinatawag ng separation of powers or checks and balances. Makikita ito sa Isaiah chapter 33 verse 2. For the Lord is our judge, the law is the Lord is our lawgiver, and the Lord is our king. So there is the judge, which is the judiciary. He is our lawgiver, which is he is the um, legislative, and the Lord is our king, who is the executive. Sinasabi, oh, walang separation don, kasi nandun lahat ni God na sa kanya lahat isa. Well, kasi wala na ba siyang kasalanan, wala siyang sinful nature. So ibig sabihin, yung tatlong functions na yan ay kinakailangan ihiwalay mo yan, no? sa iba't ibang mga institusyon ng tao. You cannot concentrate that in one person. But God has distributed these three functions to different agencies and institutions. So, it necessitates from the understanding that sin pervades all of man's human system. No? Kaya nga mayroong kasabihan, um, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Diba? Now, it also shows as yung tinatawag na republican system or representative government. Lahat ng mga ito ay makikita natin na pinag-aralan nila sa Bible, sa Deuteronomy chapter 1 verse 9 to 15 na kung saan si, si Moses ay nutusan ng mga tao na pumili sila ng mga leaders nila sa sampo, sa 50, sa isang daan, and so on and so forth. Now, but ito, sinabi natin na isa pa, yung idea of self-government, ito rin ay isang legacy na tinatawag na federal thinking. So we've all also mentioned yung tinatawag na social covenants at yung public and constituent accountability of officials. Tandaan po natin, social covenants ngayon, sinasabi na pwede kayo magtayo ng isang gobyerno dahil sa usapan, kontrata ng tao, no? Sa, sa isa't isa yung tinatawag na covenantal relationship natin sa isa't isa now but let me just make this emphasis ang lahat ng, ng, ng studies na ginawa ng mga puritans ay hindi lamang nagsimula ito sa kanila but they patterned themselves and they saw themselves to be the new Israel so they patterned themselves doon sa sa covenant sa original na covenantal people which is the 12 tribes of Israel at sinabi nila with the same concept that there are different tribes but they are bounded together in one covenantal relationship with God so they therefore we are also covenanted with each other as several colonies but now we are all coming out as different states but co- still covenanted with each other with many tribes but one God in one service so so that is what you call the yung, yung roots na tinatawag natin federalism so before Proceeding further, gusto pa lang hong paalala sa atin na whenever we talk about federalism, sometimes we talk, we think about politics and all of these things. But without actually realizing that this actually has a biblical roots. This actually has a roots in in faith natin. Now, maybe you're thinking, <laughs> where does this... Where does the Philippines fit in all of these things? No, I've given you an elaborate discussion about the roots of federalism. Now, question, is there now a reformation in the Philippines? Was there ever a reformation in the Philippines? Now, na, lagi natin naririnig na si Dr. Jose Rizal daw is a social reformer and patriot. But you know, um, 
si Rizal ba when he was talking about reforming in the Philippines was he actually under he, does Rizal actually understood the actual reformation that came maybe 200 or 300 years before him well tandaan po natin during his stay in Heidelberg in 1886 Dr. Jose Rizal met the famous philosopher's way Pastor Karl Ulmer a Protestant pastor in the neighboring village of Wilhelmsfeld in Olden Hills Pastor Ulmer invited Jose Rizal to stay in Wilhelmsfeld with his family for three months and Rizal accepted willingly because this was less expensive gave, gave him greater opportunity to speak German offered him a quiet and simple countryside alternative to the busy student life of Heidelberg and gave him the chance to experience European family life in Wilhelmsfeld Rizal met the warm and friendly hospitality of Pastor Ulmer's family. He made incredible progress in speaking and writing German and talked to the Protestant and Catholic priests, met religious tolerance, and saw the simple country people. So he left Heidelberg in April 1886 and moved to Wilhelmsfeld, although this meant a long walk through the forest and hills to attend his studies at the university. You know, Wilhelmsfeld and all of this is in Germany. What is Germany? Diyan po nagsimula ang Reformation. Bakit po? Dahil po si Martin Luther daka Germany po. And Pastor Ulmer is a Protestant preacher. In fact, uh, I believe that he is also a Lutheran pastor. Lutheran. So, ibig sabihin, Rizal was exposed to the teachings and belief of these reformers. Three months. So, makikita po natin yung Wilhelmsfeld which is in red, yan po, dyan po nag si Rizal, and uh, that is predominantly tinatawag ng mga Protestant groups. Now, so, Protestantism and Reformation in Germany. So, the Lutheran Reformation movement was a crucial event in Germany's history, German history. This theological and religious revolution had a major effect on German politics, language, and culture. Today, Germany has several religious tendencies in its midst, but Protestants remain in the majority. So, ito po makikita ninyong pictures. These are Rizal's drawing of of uh, Pastor Ulmer and his family. Uh, yung kanyang asawa at yung kanyang dalawang anak ni Pastor Ulmer. Because Rizal was very close to the family and yung influence talaga ng family nito. In fact, doon sa Wilhelmsfeld, doon niya, sa bahay ni Dr. Ulmer, doon niya naisulat ang kanyang pinakamalaking obra maestra, yung Noli Metangere. This is the book of the Philippine Revolution. And, uh, and you know, it's not a surprise. The novel expressed the maladministration of the Spanish schools, monastic orders, and actually the abuses of the um, Catholic priests during the time, mga tinatawag natin na praile, sa katauhan ni Padre Damaso. So it was very similar to what Martin Luther and and the other reformers were facing during that time. So in 1960, in fact, yung yung Hack family donated yung memorabilia nung kung saan umiinom si Dr. Jose Rizal doon sa faucet, no? Uh, nung at ngayon ito yung nakalagay ngayon doon sa sa uh, Rizal Park, yung tinatawag na No Limitang Hill Garden. At yung street na kung saan uh, nakalagay yung bahay ni Pastor Ulmer, yun ay Jose Rizal Street. No? Yung Jose Rizal Strasse na tinatawag. Yan po, makikita po ninyo, yan po yung picture no um, faucet, no? Rizal Fountain, kung saan siya umiinom doon sa may bahay ni Dr. Ulmer nung ginagawa niya yung No Limitang Hill. So, Rizal's affinity with Hil- Wilhelmsville, kung saan nandun sila Dr. Ulmer, talagang well-documented ito. Doon mismo sa isang passage na doon sa No Limitang Hill, dinescribe din niya no? sa pamagitan ni Ibarra yung kanyang pagstay doon sa Wilhelmsfeld at doon sa Europa. So Rizal left Wilhelmsfeld in Heidelberg in the late summer of 1886, went to Leipzig and Berlin where No Limitang Hill was published and eventually returned to the Philippines where he tried to convey to his people the same ideas and influences he found in Germany. So his experiences in Germany caused him to put so much emphasis on education, diligence, democratic, and civil rights through which he wanted to achieve freedom for his country and his people. Very much like the same how, how Luther and the other reformers did. Now, kita niyo po ito, no? Ito po isang letter ni Dr. Jose Salki 
Pastor Ulmer. And uh, I will just read the second um, phrase. Sinabi, I have left my country in second stanza. No? I have left my country and on the account of my book, the Filipino public welcomed Noli Matanghire very heartily. The edition is entirely exhausted. The Governor General summoned me and asked me for a copy of it. The friars were more excited was were most excited. They wanted to persecute me, but did not want uh, but they did not know how to get me. The Archbishop even threatened to excommunicate me. Parehong pareho po ng nangyari kila Martin Luther sa kanila uh, Calvin po. So the story of my return would be long to tell and hard to understand for those who do not know my life in the Philippines. Life in the Philippines. My family would not allow me to eat in any house for fear that they might poison me. Friends and enemies did me favors. The later ba- the latter burned my books and and uh, the former paid as much as 50 pesos for one co- copy. The bookstores have made big profit, but I got nothing. The friars urged me my exile, but the governor, governor replied that they would have to bring me before the court if there was anything illegal that I had done. I left my country in order to give my relatives peace. I am at, at any rate once, once more in a free land, breathing free air of Europe. My fellow countryman considers me lucky to have escaped from the Philippines. I feel like the diver Schiller described who said, I have seen horrible things, monsters which menaced me. Uh, with their talons but by the help of God I am again on the surface nonetheless I will go back Jose Rizal so Dr. Rizal even employed the strategies of the reformers like like Luther and Calvin by writing and opening the minds of the people through their written form so Germany which is the seat of Christian Reformation Martin Luther is German and started the Reformation was influenced by White Cliff and Judd and Huss a century ago, Germany is heavily all familiar with the Reformation and Pastor Karl Ulmer, being a Protestant Reformed preacher, would have shared some other way of seeing faith and religion to our national hero. If so, that would have played a factor in forming, forming Rizal's views on, do, on dominance and abuses of the Roman Catholic Church as brought about by the Spaniards. Now, but the problem here now is this. So, this might be might have given him the boldness when he understood that there can be a relationship with God directly by a person without the need to go through the Roman Catholic Church's sacraments and governmental hierarchy. This boldness was clearly in display in his work in Noli Metangere, which he completed in Germany while staying with Pastor Ulmer. His strategies and idea on how to open the eyes of his people is similar to the strategy employed by Luther and other reformers. It is by writing, just like a true reformer, his written works had the goal of emancipating the minds and inflaming the hearts of the people to thirst for freedom. Now, pero ito po ang naging problema. No? It seems like Dr. Jose Rizal was actually almost on the right path. However, reformation was not completed. But instead, a revolution happened. But this is a revolution without any reformation. Though Rizal's work resulted to opening the eyes of the noble and illustrados in the working groups in the Indios, however, it fell short on the true aim of reformation. It did not have a strong biblical foundation that urged the people to seek a personal relationship with God in Christ through His Holy Word, the Bible. Yan po ang totoo. So as for Rizal, his imagination and zeal for national emancipation was greatly influenced by the freedoms that he saw and experienced in Europe. The same freedoms that resulted from the Reformation based on the deep love and devotion of the Word of God and the Holy Scriptures. Now, question. Si Rizal ba eh, may, meron posisyon o may pananaw? patungkol sa federalismo. You will be amazed with this. Did Rizal actually predicted federalism for the Filipinos? Well, Rizal wrote doon sa kanyang sinulat, doon sa isa sa kanyang article, ang sabi niya dito, ang title nito, The Philippines a Century Hence, as the tendency of countries that have been tyrannized over when they once shake off the yoke is to adopt the freest government 
like the beat of the pendulum. By a law of reaction, the island the islands will probably declare themselves as a federal republic. <laughs> Sabi ni Rizal dito, uh, the Philippines 100 years after niya. And parang naki, naki, na, kinikinita niya kasi ngayon, yun nga pinag-uusapan natin, maybe it's more than 100 years from that time, but definitely, Rizal actually saw that you know, federalism would be a viable option or a possible option for the Filipinos once na na nakalaya. So, Rizal's reform ideas. So, wittingly or unwittingly, Rizal was again asserting a reform concept of Christian covenantalism. Whether alam niya o hindi na ang federalismo ay covenantalism, he was again asserting a reformed idea. It also showed that Rizal's study of national freedom was not only constricted to the old world, which is Europe, but also to the new world, which is the United States. So, makikita natin when the, when the Americans came to the Philippines to become the new masters of the Filipinos, they brought with them biblical Christianity. No, binuksan nila kasi sila yung mga nagsimula nga sila, yung mga reformers at napunta ang, ang America was, is the first reformed country daladala rin nila yung biblical Christianity so sabi niya at last no, we, we now have a fighting chance to really open our minds and hearts to the power that frees us from, from all bandages however the brand of biblical Christianity given to us has lacked did lack the nationalistic zeal that ought to make a nation free so per- perhaps they were very careful not to awaken the nationalistic spirit by providing a biblical ground for Filipinos to seek their own divine destiny outside the control of the U.S. Thus, biblical Christianity flourished but not the desire to take the nation and its people under the authority of the scriptures. In sum, Catholicism was still dominating the hearts and the minds of the people, making them believe that the priesthood and sainthood is only for some and not for all believers. Therefore, so, sa ngayon, Makita natin doon sa picture, don't wake the giant, no? Although, pumasok ang biblical Christianity, pero hindi natin na-translate ito sa ating national life. Talaga kasi medyo nagkaroon ng paghihiwalay, no? Ang ating re- relihiyon, ang ating pananampalataya, ang kadalas sinasabi, huwag kang makailam sa politika kasi madumi yan. Walang sinabi ang Diyos dyan. Eh, kaya nagkaroon niya yun ng great divide. Now, however, there was one important component missing in the Philippine Revolution. It is the primacy of the Word of God which fuels all reforms and freedom. Though the Filipino political realm was given freedom by the Americans in 1946, but the spiritual realm of majority of the Philippines remained enslaved due to the lack of the understanding of the Word of God. So what are the principles that we can allow today? Tandaan po natin ito. Mapatapos na po ako. First, our faith produces our society. No, sinabi po dito, the story of federalism also teaches us that true faith produces excellent works in a community of the faithful men in the word of God results in a strong and prosperous city, a city set up on a hill. We can never dissociate our faith and belief from how we live and order our lives. The communities that we build or neglect to reconstruct are reflections of what we believe as a people. Ordering society in, according, in accordance to God's word is part of God's great commission to disciple the nations. Number two, we need to continue the reform. For the Philippines, we can see that the work of reformation is barely finished. Ni pahutapos. We have an entire nation to call back to biblical Christianity. We need modern-day Puritans with covenantal mindsets and visions to build, reconstruct, and reorder their communities, starting with their, with their own selves and their families. The same time, At the same time, we need covenanters who, even though they are family men, but they also understand that the building of their families are not, the, are not an end to itself but it's only a means towards the shaping of their communities. So you disciple your families in order to reach out to the community. So, 
covenantal relationships number three, covenantal relationships of the body of Christ. Ito po yung mga mananampalataya po sa ating Panginoong Jesus. Finally, we learn that for federalism to work, it is necessary for Bible-believing Bible covenanters to unite and be covenanted with each other, love one another, have, it, have the same vision that pushes them into action, and have an ardent desire to establish a nation under God and under the authority of God's Word. The body of Christ has to unite, and Christians are not to be bystanders in what is happening to our nation today, but on the contrary, the success of our nation in its transitional phase rests upon the people of God, the people who actually believes and trusts in the Lord Jesus Christ. This is my belief. No? I believe that in allowing this issue on federalism to be in the national consciousness, God actually is signaling and calling upon every believer in the body of Christ in the Philippines to unite, regardless of political associations or preferences, to love one another and raise the banner of our Lord Jesus Christ in this nation. There's only one goal, the glory of God in Christ in all of the Philippines, and the only one King, Savior, Lord, and Master, in fact, the real sovereign in our lives is the Lord Jesus Christ. So what we need is not only a revolution of arms, revolution, economic revolution, or a revolutionary government, okay? But what we actually need is a revolution of hearts. It is the reformation of a nation. The word of God in the scriptures need not only to be a set of external laws and principles, but it must lead Filipinos to experience their God in the most personal and real way. For real freedom to be experienced in the Philippines, it is not enough that Filipinos are just religious and devout to their organized, organized religion. We need a real revolution of hearts, inflamed by the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The poor, downtrodden, and the oppressed should see that real help comes from God and not just the government. It is when the poorest and the weakest realize that they can do all things through Christ that strengthens them. Can we only truly, as a nation, really rise up? It is when the rich and the powerful in this country deeply realize that all authority belongs to Christ Jesus, King Jesus, and that He owns all things as Creator and entrusts it to us as stewards. Can we only truly solve the problem on corruption and abuse of power in our beloved nation. It is when the true believers, the saints of Jesus Christ, begins to realize that the work of reformation is barely over in the Philippines and resolves to overcome the social maladies and ills by the uncompromising and courageous declaration of the truth of God's word in all spheres of juris and jurisdictions that freedom can really be experienced by the lowliest and the most powerful in this country. It is when we realize that the body of Christ is bounded together by an irrevocable covenantal bond in Christ and that no amount of political or social differences could or should distract the body from the common vision of taking this nation to G in, in, uh, for Jesus Christ. So we need to reform the reformation or revolution of Rizal and the other revolutionaries might have been lacking, but today, we Christian Filipinos can actually complete it. So, gusto ko lang kung sabihin sa atin, no? All of these things, no, there is an unfinished work for us. Uh, that's the reason why we need to push on with the Reformation. And more than that, I believe that the greater things are ahead for the Philippines if we were willing to take up the challenge ang ating presidente ngayon on, on the challenge of federalism is there but we need to supplement what is lacking that is the firm foundation of the word of God so there you go so maraming salamat po sa inyo I hope that you understood a lot of things andan po natin na mahalaga po ang may alam sa batas pero mas mahalaga po na meron po tayo personal na relasyon sa ating Panginoong Jesus that would really strengthen us as a person, as a family as a community, as a nation. Maraming salamat po. God bless you po. Ako po si attorney, pastor ni Jeremiah Belica. Papasalamat po sa inyo.